This is a chapter-by-chapter -chapter summary of the 1999 book Unrestricted Warfare, written by Chao Liang and Wang Shangshua, two colonels in the Chinese military who outlined their vision of warfare in the 21st century and how leaders should evolve their thinking in order to be successful in a rapidly changing landscape. Many would argue the book has been prophetic in its characterization of conflict in post-modernity. In addition to its new conceptual framework of war, Unrestricted Warfare offers an outsider's perspective of the American military mindset and the trajectory of the West generally. This summary closely follows the structure of the book and may not be the most concise. I hope to provide a thorough overview of the contents. I believe this work deserves much more attention due in equal parts to its innovative thinking regarding warfare, which truly goes beyond conventional boundaries, and the increasing relevance of its ideas to the future of the global order. The heart of the analysis in Unrestricted Warfare is the philosophical and spiritual effects of technology on man and the unavoidable nature of war. The authors make many bold assertions in a style that is increasingly rare in Western thinking. You might not agree with the entire contents of Unrestricted Warfare, but its poignant analysis is difficult to ignore. The views presented in the following summary are mostly of the authors. Preface Desert Storm represented a fundamental change in how warfare is conducted. The war was a dazzling display of new technology on the battlefield. The success of Desert Storm and the fall of the Soviet Union confirmed the sole superpower status of the United States. Despite this change in the world order, the U.S. would not simply coast from victory to victory. The success of Desert Storm would not be replicated, and the nature of armed conflict during the 1990s became increasingly complex. Examples of this include Somalia and the wars in the former Yugoslavia. The increasing complexity in conflict is reflective of the increasing complexity in society. A globalized and interconnected world will undoubtedly lead to conflict between different interests. Even if there is a reduction in conventional warfare, there is increasing semi-warfare, quasi-warfare, and sub-warfare. War has not been eliminated, it has changed forms. The view that world peace is on the horizon is naive. A reduction in military violence has coincided with a rise in economic, political, and technological violence. Regardless of the form of violence, war is war, and the principles of war still apply. War has changed from using armed force to compel the enemy to submit to one's will, to using all means, including armed force or non-armed force, military or non-military, and lethal and non-lethal means to compel the enemy to accept one's interests. Part 1. On New Warfare Instead of mankind developing and controlling technology, increasingly mankind is being controlled by technology. This is the result of man playing the role of God. While technology has been gained, wisdom has been lost. Technology has become so complex, new developments can no longer be attributed to a single inventor. Likewise, we are entering into an age that cannot be defined by a single kind of technology. Information technology has brought about the information age, but information technology is serving as the catalyst for every other form of technology. It allows the interaction and integration of many technologies into entirely new technologies, leading to a second industrial revolution. An ensemble of instruments is now replacing solo instruments. Technology is often developed for and applied to warfare before other fields. Desert Storm was impressive not only because of new weapons technology, but because of the ability to use weapons in a highly systematic way. The use of systems will now shape war far more than the weapons that serve as mere components in them. Systemization is an attempt to make sense of an increasingly complex and blurry situation. The increasing systemization of warfare mirrors the systemization of the world by people. Chapter 1. 
the weapons revolution which invariably comes first. Throughout history, advancements in weapons technology have led to changes in strategy and tactics. One new weapon was typically enough to completely change warfare. Examples include the stirrup, Maxim machine gun, and nuclear weapons. In the future, however, the importance of individual weapons will decrease regardless of how high-tech they are. This trend is seen at the end of the 20th century, where the broad concept of information technology is used to categorize advancements in warfare instead of a single weapon. The term high technology is another attempt to deal with the myriad of changes happening simultaneously. What is considered high technology is relative and always changing. As a concept, this is insufficient to truly understand the direction warfare is going. There is a dichotomy in warfare that separates traditional from contemporary military thinking. Traditionally, one fought the fight that fit one's weapons. Today, it is more common to build the weapons to fit the fight. The traditional mindset is somewhat passive in that it works within boundaries as opposed to expanding the boundaries. The evolution of warfare has resulted in weapons preceding tactics. Unfortunately, the makers of weapons can't foresee how their new weapons will interact or change tactics. Presently, those with few resources are forced to consider tactics over weaponry out of necessity. This mindset, which was once passive, is now becoming active. The endless pursuit of new weapon technology can become a kind of passive helplessness. It's possible to make an old weapon highly effective by retrofitting it with new technology, for example, a B-52 with cruise missiles. The mixing of old and new technology will only increase. A new weapon with nothing to pair it with can be very ineffective. Developing high-tech concept weapons is like making a banquet without knowing who will show up. The further the technology gap is between two weapons, the less certain it is which weapon will win. High-tech weapons are less effective against low-tech weapons than mid-tech weapons. Humvees versus IEDs, for example. Another dichotomy is new concept weapons versus a new concept of weapons. The pursuit of concept weapons is actually itself the old concept of weapons. The goal of the F-117 Nighthawk, for example, is to bomb a target stealthily. To kill and not be detected is not a new concept. Part of the trap of concept weapons is that they can eventually bankrupt a country. The collapse of the USSR was partly caused by its attempt to outspend the United States in concept weapons. The cost of concept weapons seems to get exponentially more expensive with each decade. It's best that low- and middle-income countries focus on developing a concept of weapons as opposed to concept weapons. While concept weapons focus on narrow military aims, a concept of weapons can allow a country to effectively use anything as a weapon. This approach places an emphasis on strategy over technology. Where concept weapons are impressive in power, a concept of weapons is impressive in scope. During the 20th century, there was almost an obsession with increasing the lethality of weapons. Ultra-lethal weapons, like nuclear weapons, forced a reassessment of the lethality of weapons and ethics broadly. Weapons have since trended towards lesser lethality, with development of non-lethal and precision weapons. There are many strategic advantages to this approach apart from ethical considerations, so the trend will likely continue. This doesn't mean that war will become some kind of simulation or game. The essence of war is still one party subjugating another, either through compulsion or through imposition. Chapter 2. The War God's Face Has Become Indistinct The reasons why a war is fought have traditionally been simple. Common soldiers could fully understand the reasons why they fought. As time goes on, however, conflict emerges due to increasingly complex and convoluted reasons. In Desert Storm, soldiers had a very different and simpler understanding of the causes for the conflict from that of politicians and military leaders. 
Alliances between nations are being made and broken with increasing frequency, which can be confusing. Alliances are based on self-interest and in a quickly changing geopolitical landscape, the web of alliances changes faster than the narrative regarding those alliances. To further complicate things, in any conflict there are many involved parties at many levels. The interests of parties at the subnational level aren't always aligned despite the behavior of the nation in a war. Trying to understand the situation is like observing a kaleidoscope. The interests of a war will at least be as complicated as those who partake in it. The overt goals of a war are very different from the covert goals. The spaces where wars are fought have increased as technology has advanced. The battlefield is now becoming unrestricted. There is no place that is not the battlefield. War is expanding into the electromagnetic spectrum, digital space, and psychological realm. The concept of multidimensional warfare includes all the new spaces war can happen, as well as how these spaces interact and intersect. When the battlefield is everywhere, the distinction between military and civilian is less clear. The people tasked with conducting war are becoming increasingly educated, technical, and specialized. Smarter countries after the Cold War transitioned their military using new ideas rather than outright reductions in size and capability. The new military will not outwardly resemble the traditional forms of martial ability. Society is becoming less masculine, and this is reflected in the military. A hacker today is more effective in a war than a Rambo-like warrior. Non-state actors have begun using unlimited means for unlimited wars against states which use limited means for limited wars. Elite professionals can use their resources and abilities in entirely legal ways to cause harm to states comparable in damage to terrorist groups. Soldiers don't have a monopoly on war. States are going the way of the dinosaurs. Terrorism is largely a consequence of globalization and integration. In the 1990s, the U.S. tried to define what means and methods define contemporary warfare. They decided upon information warfare, precision warfare, joint operations, and military operations other than war. Joint operations was simply a continuation of coalition warfare, while information war and precision war sought to make war cleaner through non-contact or remote war. Military operations other than war will likely encompass an ever-growing share of military operations. There's a difference between non-military war operations and military operations other than war. The latter is confined to military activity outside of a state of war while the former is any activity aimed at carrying out a war. The U.S. did not develop their understanding of military operations other than war to this degree. Some emerging types of warfare include trade war, financial war, terror war, and ecological war. Trade war was once a descriptive phrase, but now represents a serious form of warfare that includes domestic trade law, tariffs, sanctions, and embargoes, which culminate in damages comparable to a traditional war. Financial war can be waged by non-state organizations against states. Billionaires are as good as generals in this regard. Financial war can be expensive to wage, but is easy to engage in and conceal. Examples include the actions of financial firms during the 1997 Asian financial crisis and in Albania after the collapse of the USSR. Terror war can be separated into traditional terror war and new terror war. Traditional terror war is characterized by the use of violence and mass casualties to produce terror. The new terror war includes many more modes of creating terror in a subject population, for example, spreading disinformation to create social unrest. The terror war, regardless of strategy, uses limited means to accomplish unlimited aims. States naturally find this difficult to guard against, even if they turn to terrorism themselves. Ecological war involves influencing the natural environment in the pursuit of war. 
this form of warfare should become an increasing concern as states pursue development at all costs, and the ecological balance is made more delicate. Other forms of warfare include, but are not limited to, psychological, smuggling, media, drug, network, technology, fabrication, resource, and law. New technology will inevitably spawn additional forms of war. There are endless ways to combine various types of warfare. There is no need to limit warfare to arms, because ultimately, the goal is to use all means available to force an enemy to serve one's own interests. Chapter 3. A Classic That Deviates from the Classic Desert Storm has become a classic example of technology-driven methods of warfare. In many ways, it heralded a new age of warfare and garnered much study at the beginning of the 21st century by those trying to understand what could come next. The large number of nations that allied against Iraq was termed the Overnight Alliance. It was a happy coincidence that every nation involved had some interest in a war against Iraq. Western nations saw the actions of Saddam as threatening their energy interests, oil being the lifeblood of their economies. For Saudi Arabia, the invasion of Kuwait destabilized their neighborhood, and they were happy to assist in restoring the regional balance of power. The coalition of nations properly represented the age of globalism in the realm of war. For the U.S., the coalition was instrumental in legitimizing the war and generating consent from the public. The overnight nature of the alliance also brought the traditional fixed-form alliance to a close. Despite their pridefulness, Americans tend to learn quickly from mistakes. Lessons learned from military engagements leading up to Desert Storm were instrumental in reorganizing the command structure of the military and setting it up for success. Competition is inherent among the various components of the U.S. military and the U.S. government generally. This caused problems for command and control during the invasion of Grenada. The Department of Defense Reorganization Act in 1986 attempted to address this by changing the structure of the military from a tree to a network and reducing levels of command. This essentially made it clear who had authority and enabled units of the military to more quickly share information. The authors attribute the successful implementation of the DOD Reorganization Act to the contractual mentality of American society. Similar reorganization is required of any organization if it wishes to be successful in the new operational environment of the 21st century. Another shift that occurred during Desert Storm was a move away from the air-land battle model developed during the Cold War in expectation of a war in continental Europe with Warsaw Pact countries. In Desert Storm, the battle was almost all air, no land. As a result of the DoD Reorganization Act, a highly centralized air tasking order was able to effectively command over a thousand air units daily. This integrated model became influential in the development of omnidimensional combat operations. The primacy of tanks in ground warfare was challenged by the striking performance of attack helicopters during Desert Storm. For the first time, it was shown that helicopters could conduct ground operations independent of other combat units. Doctrine up to that point held that helicopters were best suited for support roles. Despite this performance, the U.S. still did not fully recognize how instrumental helicopters were to the ground war and focused on more exotic weapons. Similar to how Yamamoto used aircraft carriers in revolutionary ways, but did not realize their importance over battleships in naval warfare. The media was an essential component of the success of Desert Storm. Unlike Vietnam, the U.S. military effectively controlled what the media had access to and what they reported, but the media also regulated themselves. Iraqi military leaders were manipulated by false news reports of U.S. troop movements. Super weapons were discussed at length, despite many of the weapons not being as super as they were reported to be. The media convincingly painted Saddam Hussein as the Great Satan, while denying Iraq any platform for propaganda. The media can be a double-edged sword, however. Coverage of the, quote, highway of death caused Bush to end the war earlier than planned. 
After Desert Storm, it became clear that the media was an essential consideration to achieve victory. The complexity of Desert Storm makes it a good specimen for analysis. Just as an apple can be sliced in numerous ways, so too can Desert Storm be seen from numerous perspectives. Other notable aspects of Desert Storm include the political considerations that led to the cost-sharing proposal by the U.S. to coalition nations. Splitting the bill was less about economic concerns and more about presenting international consensus and perception management. The use of shock and awe tactics was very effective from the domain of psychological warfare. The use of new technology and the creative mixing of old technology with new technology for combined effect was notable. Organization restructuring, streamlined operations, and simplified management. A high concentration of historically notable advancements occurred during Desert Storm, making it important to study and helpful in considering new methods of warfare. Chapter 4. What do Americans have to gain by touching the elephant? After Desert Storm, the branches of the U.S. military had to reconsider their role in the post-Cold War era. Each branch tried to analyze Desert Storm and derive insights to prepare for the new operational environment and limit force reductions and budget cuts. This is similar to many hands trying to size up an elephant hidden behind a fence. Each hand touches a different part of the animal and draws conclusions based on this limited sensory input. The Army tried implementing new experimental technology, but the wisdom of reform based on technology alone is questionable. The Air Force was emboldened by its major role in the success of Desert Storm and began a serious competition with the Army for primacy. The Air Force reorganized its structure and argued for expansion into electronic, information, and space warfare. The Navy was concerned because its role in Desert Storm was mostly supporting the other branches. It advanced the concept of From Sea to Land, which highlighted other branches' reliance on the Navy to traverse the oceans and operate around the world. While the goals the Navy set for itself were not as ambitious or exciting as the other branches, they addressed fundamental concerns, and ultimately, the Navy was less subjected to budget cuts than the other branches of the U.S. military. Desert Storm served as yet another example of the American obsession with expensive weapons and an aversion to casualties, during the war, high-tech weaponry satisfied both of these proclivities. The cost and material demands of the war were historical. The hypersensitivity to casualties grew out of the Vietnam War, and by the time of Desert Storm, avoiding casualties was as important as achieving victory. In a conflict against the U.S., inflicting a high number of casualties is a sure path to success. Victory can rarely be achieved without losses. The over-reliance on high-tech weaponry to avoid casualties will ultimately lead the U.S. to neglect sound military thinking and strategy. Many other countries are attempting to follow the American model of luxury warfare and will encounter similar problems as a result. Complex weapon systems will become increasingly difficult to employ effectively in combat. The high-tech arms race is a marathon, but war is more like a soccer field. Ultimately, wishful thinking regarding weapons technology will cause more casualties instead of preventing them. American military thinking lags behind American technology, but as of 1999, America was comfortably in the lead. Despite falling short of a true revolution in military affairs, doctrine has changed in fundamental ways. The joint campaign represents a centralization and integration of command, bringing the branches of the military closer to unification than ever before. The U.S. military stopped short of truly realizing unrestricted warfare in the 1993 publication, The Essentials of War, which outlined the concept of total dimensional warfare. This concept includes the principles of total depth, total height, total frontage, total time, total frequency, and multiple methods. The idea of non-combat operations faced opposition from more conservative leaders in the military who argued that reducing the emphasis of combat would confuse the role of the military. Total dimensional warfare was stifled in favor of traditional military doctrine, representing a failure to realize a revolution of military affairs after a revolution of technology. This was part one of my summary of the book Unrestricted Warfare. For part two, check the link in the description below.